So Becky, you say that, that God has never give up on you, given up on you. Um, share with us some examples of how you've experienced God never giving up on you. Okay, well first, I think I need to give you a little bit about my past. I was probably Becky of Sunnybrook Farm. I had a farm girl upbringing till I was about 12 years old. And then my family started moving. My dad uh, couldn't make a living with farming. We started moving. We moved to uh, Hooks, Texas, right out of Texarkana. And then the next move we made was to Little Rock, Arkansas. Each time we moved, my family seemed to move further and further away from their faith. Uh, they got less uh, active in their church. And I grew up very closely related to the church and my grandmothers. And the women in my life were godly women. My aunts, I, I just, it, it was amazing to grow up covered by so much love. I never knew a time when Jesus didn't love me. I grew up singing all the little songs we sang in church. I grew up with memory verses. I grew up just loving God and made a profession of faith when I was 10 years old and was baptized in a river. So I'm totally country. But as we moved, then we moved a little bit further away from God. However, he never gave up on me. And as a high school student, my senior year, I was dating a young man who was the wrong young man. Thought I could change him, never do that. Uh, then uh, in college, I dated a young man who was Jewish and his family had come from the Russian ghetto. His grandparents still spoke Russian. They did not speak English. We were both pulled by families because both families were saying, uh, no, no, you, you don't need to date. Uh, and so God was at work in that. I was representing my university, which was Little Rock University at the time, in a contest down in Pensacola, Florida. I was living a life of um, pretty much what I wanted to do and about me. And I was pretty excited about an acting career. And I wanted to go to New York. I was in a contest representing my school and a lady named Terry, don't know her last name, somehow took a liking to me. She was the secretary for Amanda Blake who played Kitty and gun smoke on television. And Terry was her secretary and with her, of course, and Amanda Blake was doing some of the judging. So I don't know why this woman came into my presence. It was just totally blind. And she sat me down and she started talking to me about the acting career and about Amanda Blake and her role and what she had gone through. And it wasn't pretty. And I left after listening to Terry with the thought, I couldn't have a normal life. I couldn't be a normal wife and mother. I don't want that kind of life. My mother had already been after me to take education hours. She wasn't too happy with my speech drama major and the path I was going to take. And so I went back to school, got my hours in education, and started teaching school. If I had not done that, I would not have met my wonderful husband, who was a precious man. God answered my prayers for the person that I wanted and desired in such a special way. I always wanted someone really tall. He was 6'5". Mm. I wanted someone by that time that was a member of the Protestant denomination at least because I had, I had had experience with men, that young men, one who was not godly, one who was not of any, my faith. And so I knew what I wanted. And I didn't really meet Gib until I was 23. Uh, Gib 
was uh, just, he was in medical school. He was a, see, well, I met him when he was, he had graduated from his, or not graduated, but it was uh, at the end of his junior year. And uh, I went through his senior year with him, which was a lot easier than the earlier years. But anyway, the thing that really just, it, it was an experience that's hard to talk about because my family down in the country didn't understand why I wasn't married. I was 23 years old, and we went down to see Dad's people a lot where I grew up as a child. And they loved me dearly, but they would say things like, now why aren't you married? Or they would say things like, um, well now you, you need a husband. Or, and my grandfather, my dad's father, was the worst. He would say things like, well, you're going to be an old maid? Wow. <laughs> so uh, at 23, before I met Gib, I was really concerned if I would ever find someone. And then he was introduced to me through a companion teacher at uh, Little Rock Central High School, which is a famous high school for the integration crisis. So that's kind of where I met my husband and my life, but my life changed. God brought, I, I'm, I'm fully convinced God brought Terry into my life because I was headed right down the wrong path. And um, I would have to say from that on, God has talked to me in words not words that I hear from God, but words I hear through godly people. And he has brought some of the most wonderful godly people into my life. And they have said things and done things that have changed my life. Uh, some have been pastors. Uh, one pastor in McAllen, Texas, said something that I'll never forget. What's in the well comes up in the bucket. And being a country girl, I knew exactly what, if you can't get fresh water, and my dad's house, the water ran out one time, and so he was pulling up mud. So I knew exactly what that preacher was talking about. Uh, things like that have spoken to me and have changed my life because I realized, look, I don't have my heart fully set on God. And that little statement in a sermon just made a, a big difference to me. And even coming here to talk to you, words made a difference because I was a little concerned. What am I going to say to Jerry? I mean, he's invited me to come do this, and I'm not sure what I'm going to say to him. And I want to be able to say the right things and the things that God wants me to say. So I'm kind of blunt and straightforward most of the time, and sometimes I step on people's toes because I'm not politically correct. <laughs> but... I, you know, I want to say the right things. Sure. Well, God gave me a devotional this morning that was the right thing. He said, I'm helping you, basically, in this devotional. So, yeah, it's been words for me, Jerry, that have changed my life. Words and music. Um, I remember singing, thank you, Lord, so often. And I, even when I have to pull on an interstate from a side road, before I pull on, I said, God, help me get on this interstate. Help me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, God's just in my life. Yes. And he has never, ever forsaken me. Becky, how has your relationship with God changed over the years? I suppose it has changed from... Let me read something that I wrote. Okay. Uh, as words changed my life. The words also from the Bible but words from Celebrate Recovery and words from um, Rick Warren through Purpose Driven Life and um, also Blackaby, um, Experiencing God. The, it made me go deeper into God's Word and want to know God closer, more intimately. And this is something I wrote after my husband died I had two, two times when I was really angry with God, and one of these was when my husband died. Yet, at the same time, I was grateful because he was in such pain and had gone through 18 months of literally 
just physical misery. He had uh, kidney cancer that had um, metastasized to the bones. And um, I remember one night he just turned over and broke his collarbone because he had a tumor, I guess, in the collarbone area. He, it just was hard, very hard. And I had family that came along and helped me, but I needed further help. And so I joined Celebrate Recovery, uh, was going to the uh, program at Central Baptist Church, and then we had our own program here for a while, which was really good. But here is something I wrote, and I think to answer your question, I'm kind of uh, going on, but to answer your question, my identity was, at the time, in what I do, not who I truly am. I was a wife. Well, that was gone. I was a mother, but now my children are mothering me. Uh, my grandmothers were gone, but now I can be a good grandmother. I have eight of the finest grandchildren you'd ever want to see, or experience, or be around. So I, and I love being a grandmother. And then I wrote, one day I will be gone. Who I am in Christ is never gone. I like to write, and I like to act, and I like to sing. Uh, there are a lot of things I like to do, but I love Jesus, and I've loved him since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And it was because I had great-grandmothers. The women in my family and extended family were stronger than the men as far as their faith. Wow. Uh, my dad's grandmother was an amazing woman. and. I loved her dearly. In fact, they tell me that I would pick bitter weeds as a child, run down the road and put them on her grave, go into the church, and I, would, I remember sitting down at a piano. I didn't know how to play the piano, but I just bang on it and just sing my heart out. My favorite was the Battle Hymn of the Republic, so I could be really loud and, and active. And then I'd go up and see my Aunt Doopy, who Doopy is a crazy name, but she, oh, she was a wonderful woman. So I had, I just, I think what I want to say about how it changed my life is just drew me closer, always closer, always dependent on God. I have had um, three close experiences with wrecks, car wrecks that could have killed me. And for some reason they didn't, and I can only say God was in control. Um, I had a friend who, in McAllen, that I loved dearly. She was a funny, humorous girl, and she had three boys. And I used to envy her because all, her husband and those three boys just adored her. And she had a terrible wreck one day, and she and her youngest son survived it. He was probably eight or nine years old. And she, <laughs> she said something I'll never forget. She said, there were feathers all over that car. And I said, what do you mean? Well, the angels were watching over me. Oh, wow. <laughs> and her little boy, um, I'm sure she had him, well, I'm not sure, but I would think she had him seat belted, but he wound up under the dash on the floor mm -hmm. and wasn't injured. I mean, he may have had bruises, but not really injured. She said feathers were all over the, just all over the floor. <laughs> And uh, that picture has stayed with me, yeah. you know, of oh, yeah. God watching over us. The last time that I almost was killed in a car has been recent. I got rid of the car and bought something that a trucker could see me in because I was uh, going out of Memphis. I was going to see my son. Trucks were lined up going uphill. Uh, we had passed Memphis and t more toward Jackson because he lives in the Nashville area. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is my chance to get around these trucks because most of them probably have a load. And so I was at the back of this long line. So I pulled out, gunned it. It was probably going 80 miles an hour. And the trucker in front of me decided to pull, oh, no. decided to pull into the passing lane. I, he couldn't see me. I was below his mirror. I was in the grass. One, one, I know I, one tire was in the grass, one on the, um, uh, what do you call it? The shoulder. Shoulder, yeah. 
and I looked like I was going to go under his uh, trailer. And I, I, I remember thinking, well, God, this is it. But it wasn't it. And I can't tell you how really it materialized that I didn't get killed. Mm -hmm. Because I knew I had a big black SUV behind me. Mm -hmm. And I thought that SUV would probably get me if the right. trucker didn't. But evidently, he saw the wreck coming and had pulled back. It gave me a lot of time. It, mm -hmm. We missed each other. I don't know how. And I pulled over into the right lane and was going to pull over onto the other shoulder and just stop because that was, at that point, I was about to fall apart in the sure. shakes. My son called me at that moment and said, Hey, Mom, where are you? <laughs> oh. And that got my attention. And so the shakes quit. And I just kept going, but that's the that was the closest mm -hmm. that I had of coming. And I thought about those feathers, yeah. That yep. that was that came to my mind. Uh, so you had them all over the car. All over the car, yeah. yeah. Becky, you said <clears throat> that um, that over time God has just been chipping away mm -hmm. at that at you and at your, and at your life to to make you into that person that. That he wants you to be. How have you? How have the second chances he's given you affected your life and your relationship with him? My relationship is more personal, and I've been angry with God twice. Really angry. The first time was this aunt that I told you about shortly that lived across the street from the church that I would go visit. She got into alcohol and became addicted. And I didn't know it. And then I, I found, I was visiting as an adult with my uh, parents in the country and my aunt was acting strange. And my mom told me that she had a drinking problem. I just fell apart. And I remember going into my parents' bedroom, they weren't there, and screaming at God. You let her get like this, why? 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 I was just really angry. And I know you can control us. Why? Why? She's a godly woman and she's ruining her reputation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was just really letting it go. And then all of a sudden, there was this quietness. And God spoke to me, not orally, but in my soul, in my heart, I heard, I've got this in control, Becky. I, you don't have to worry about it. I've got it under control. And I remember the peace. Um, and okay, thank you, God. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it was just, I knew he had it under control. And I wrote her a letter. I knew I could not face her. It would have killed both of us because she loved me dearly and I loved her. So I wrote her a letter and basically saying, you need to get some help. And she did. And she went to one of my first cousins, another girl cousin that she just loved dearly. Uh, in I believe they were in Missouri at the time. Mm -hmm. And she went to rehab. And when she came back, Gib and I were visiting down in the country and she called us to come visit her. And we went to see her and she poured out her heart to me and apologized and said that letter kicked her into rehab. So God used you mm -hmm. to offer her a second chance. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Spoken words, written words, God's word. Yes. Uh, celebrate recovery. I've been in community Bible study. I've been in Bible study fellowship. I love studying God's Word. I love being in God's Word. And when my husband died of cancer was the other time I was angry with God, um, but relieved at the same time because he had suffered so much. His grave is in the little country church, churchyard. He loved the country. He wanted to buy my mom and dad's place and I wouldn't let him because I was afraid he'd sit me out there in the country where I didn't want to be. Uh, 
And uh, you didn't want to live the rest of your life as, as Becky of Sunnybrook Falls. No, right? <laughs> no, uh, where the street lights end and the pavement ends. Mm -hmm. That's too far out for me. <laughs> when uh, this gal left the country, the country left the gal. I got you. Yeah. So when he died, I was I was angry uh, again, and I thought, you know, I got to get out of this. I was I was getting de depressed, and I've got to get out of this. What can I do? We'll celebrate recovery. Was the answer, and I I had wonderful experience with celebrate recovery and with the things that I learned. And my family, it was community. My family gathered around me. Actually, my, we were living in Little Rock when he began to get sick. Um, his cancer was in the kidney and they removed his right kidney in 99. He was active duty Air Force Colonel at uh, Wilford Hall and um, head of the ophthalmology department at Wilford Hall. He uh, decided to stay active duty. He, re he recovered well from his surgery. And they told him that if he made it five years without recurrence, that he probably would uh, not die of something else. He was within two days of celebrating that five year anniversary when they discovered that he had cancer in, in his bones, he had it in his spine. And then it just began, he, he said it's like Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man? Chomp, mm -hmm. chomp, 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 chomp. It just kept chomping away at him. Mm -hmm. He had a hip replacement. He was due for another hip replacement. I, it just And then finally, I don't know whether it was the medication or the cancer that got him, but his lungs just failed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, he wanted to stay in Little Rock. His dad was there, and the reason we were there was to help his parents. His mother had already died, and he had been there to help her, and mm -hmm. it was it was good. Uh, and I wanted to move here because I knew my son was in the Air Force at that time, and an emergency room doctor in resident. Yeah, he was a resident, mm -hmm. and I knew he could get a humanitarian assignment to Wilford Hall. So I really wanted to move here because my daughter and son-in-law were here. And Gib dug his feet in and wanted to stay in Little Rock. His sister was there, his dad was there. So it was, it was a tug of war for a little bit. We stayed in an apartment in a, a retirement center where his dad was so that we could help his dad and look after him. The manager of the retirement center came one day and said, Gib, you're not going to make it. We know it and you know it. Uh, uh, Becky is taking care of you and she's doing a good job, but she gets tired. And we've got an apartment up here where she can go and take some rest and we'll bring someone in to help you. Uh, but what are, you, what are your plans? And then Gib told her, and he was very honest and forthright and then told her that uh, he wanted to stay there and she wants to go to the children. And she looked at him, she said, Gib, you're gonna walk the streets of gold. You're gonna have a wonderful life ahead of you. You need to take care of Becky. And he thought about it and he actually said, well, I'm the one that's sick. <laughs> and she said, yes, but you've got something that's like the icing on the cake coming, basically is what she was saying. And the very next day, our pastors in Little Rock visited us and said the same thing, didn't know that manager, didn't know that manager had said anything, mm -hmm. and said the exact same thing. So I think God has worked through me with sure. words, okay. words after words. Oh, you know, I told you I had three bad wrecks. Well, one of them was in ice on a bridge. And my aunt was with me and we were, it was Christmas Eve, and we were headed from Little Rock down to this country for Christmas with the family. The car uh, went out of control. I'd never been on ice like that before. And I remember my dad had always said, don't put on the brakes. Don't put on the brakes. So I didn't put on the brakes. I, took, I didn't even know what to do with the steering wheel. So my hands went up, no brakes. The car went zoom, hit the, bank, uh, the buttress of the bridge, 
back over here, hit that buttress. We did a turn, and as we turned and straightened up, a car went past me. The car stopped finally, and I, I remember just put, holding the steering wheel and put my head down. And my aunt was over at the side, and she said, Thank you, Lord. And I said, You are so right. Thank you, Lord. Yes. And then we started driving, and my aunt said, I've got a headache. You're going to have to pull over and stop and let me get some aspirin because she, she had migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got aspirin, and I don't know how I got home. I mean, down I to the country, imagine. but I did. And uh, I, those are, you just, you know, yeah. God gave me a second chance, and the thank you was such a blessing. Oh, yeah. Another time when God changed my life was in a, are you familiar with a lay witness mm -hmm. mission? That's, I, I guess, is it Methodist uh, type thing or? It yeah. Was, it was. It was in the Methodist Church. Okay, we were in West Memphis, Arkansas, a young couple with two small children, going to church regularly, trying to live a fairly decent life, but still pretty much our own pleasure. Uh, and, you know, we were having fun, and uh, Gib was working really hard. He was a resident uh, in ophthalmology, and we had a lay witness mission. They came on Thursday and stayed through Sunday night. We had prayer meetings and group meetings in the home. Gib could not go to the final meeting, so I went by myself. And I was sitting back in probably the middle of the church on a pew. And a man got up that I had not met during the service. He had been a gutter bum. I mean, he had hit a rock bottom. Mm. He was fairly toothless. He, he spoke with a and um, you could almost see the spit coming out when he talked. He was someone that as a young, I wouldn't say a socialite, but as a young woman that was just having a ball. And my husband's pay was coming from the Air Force. He had an Air Force sponsored residency. So it was, it was really nice. We were, we were doing well with our two young children and we thought we were just really doing good. But I watched that man who talked to me about God and how God was changing his life and had picked him up out of the gutter. And he closed his talk by singing a cappella, his hand is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I knew that man had more peace in his life than I, as a young woman with everything you could want, had in mind. And that was a change. And it made a huge difference. I went home and I said, Gib, we're getting rid of the alcohol. Uh, what? Because he never had problems with alcohol. I said, we're getting rid of it. Uh, we got a lot of money invested in this stuff, you know? And I said, look, let's just pour it down the toilet. Gib said, ah, let's not do that. Let's give it to so-and-so. Well, this so-and-so that he wanted to give it to had almost killed us driving us home drunk from a from a lake in one afternoon. I mean, I've had some really interesting experiences. So we argued back and forth for a long time what to do with this alcohol. Um, and finally, he did agree, and we poured it down the toilet. But when we got out to California, he was active duty. Uh, may, I think he was major by then. Uh, and uh, no, he was lieutenant colonel. And uh, he was. Uh, he just said, look, we have people, we, we at least need to serve wine because we've got people coming, you know, uh, to entertain and they're going to think we are the cheapest people in the world if we don't offer something. And I said, nope, we're going to stick with tea and Cokes and they drink what we serve or they don't drink at all. <laughs> so I stuck to my guns. Well, Gib still was not comfortable with this and he we moved from California to McAllen, and he went into private practice, but he stayed active duty reserve. <clears throat> and when we first moved there, he said, why don't we join the Episcopal Church? They don't have anything. We were Baptist at that time and Methodist, half Baptist, half Methodist. And uh, so he said, let's join the Episcopal Church. They don't have any problem with wine. So we went to visit an Episcopal church. We were in the, uh, what do they call their uh, 
opening thing. They have, they have a name for it, and I can't remember what it is. But anyway, we were standing there. He said, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we never went into the service. And then um, also, before he left completely from California, they had a wine tasting party as a going away party for him. He had a technician that got too much wine and tried to pick a fight with him. And that's what did it. That's what did it. He said, alcohol's out of the house. I see the light. Yeah, he just never had had a problem with it. Uh, we even had a uh, friend who went into the Methodist ministry, by the way, after he retired from the military and uh, went to uh, school in California. I, really? You'd recognize the name. Probably Fuller? No. no. Uh, it's a different one, but it was a Methodist school that he went to. Hmm. Uh, but he we were having dinner with them, and he was trying to show Gib the difference between beverages that hurt you and beverages that don't hurt you. And he was using a bottle of ketchup. Oh, gosh. And he said, you see this bottle of I mean, he just, he gave a beautiful presentation, and Gib really listened to him. Wow. So, yeah, we had, we had those experiences. And then I guess the last thing I would say in how God really spoke to me, our marriage was wonderful, but every marriage goes through a struggle. I, I, if somebody tells me they don't have problems in their marriage, I'm going to say, hmm, I wonder. Because I thought we had the, one of the best marriages. But there was a point in time when Gib moved from McAllen and his private practice, sold his practice when he was... Uh, sent into active duty and we went into uh, Bossier City and he was at Barksdale Air Force Base and he went into severe depression and I didn't understand that depression but he said it was worse than death the so I mean just it was such a change changing his private practice and getting back into the military active duty as a colonel and very responsible and it was very it was a lot of pressure but I didn't quite understand it. And so we had a lot of arguments. Well, I was going to Bible study fellowship at the time. And my Bible study fellowship leader, who made the, she would give a talk. In her talk, we were at the point of Jesus uh, going before Pilate. She made the point that if you have somebody accusing you of something, you need to be like Jesus. Jesus stood before his accusers dumb. He identified himself, but he didn't argue with them. If you are guilty, you don't have any argument. And if you're innocent, God will defend you far better than you can defend yourself. I quit arguing with Gib. And that bothered him. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, you're not talking back. But I sat for a long time with my Bible, with my Bible study fellowship material, would pray and would read that Bible and listen to things that I learned that I hadn't really thought about before. Things like let your yes be yes and your no, no. And now if somebody says I promise, <laughs> I'm looking at mm, You can't promise anything because you don't even know if you're gonna breathe the next breath. You're not in control. That's right. So it, it's just, been, I know that God has his hands on me. Yes. He's got my back, he's got my front, he's got the sides. Yes. Yeah, I just have no doubt. So I ask you one last question. What is the most significant thing, the most important thing, you, what is the most important thing you would like to say about your experience with the God of Second Chances? What I'm saying to God, the most important thing I can say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He has given me two children that love him, that serve him, that worship him. He's given me eight grandchildren. Each of my children have four children who serve God. Love him, belong to him, 
made professions of faith, that is, that's the gift. And I pray that they will go forward and make a difference. Constantly pray for my grandchildren to make a difference. I have one that is married now. He married this past uh, May. He's in medical school in Memphis. And then I have seven that are now licensed drivers. Wow. And I have a 12-year-old. And that 12-year-old still comes and tells me good night and hugs me. It gives me a kiss. And he loves Jesus. <laughs> That's good. If I can help them to help them really dig in and be Christ-like in this society we have, then thank you, God. My husband is, like I told you, is buried in the country, and on his grave it says, well done. I would like for Jesus to say that to me. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of the process, but I'm not afraid to die. I look forward to that door opening to a new life in Christ, personally, to see Him face to face. Fanny Crosby was once uh, asked, just think what you could have done if you had your eyesight. And she looked at that person and said, oh, but Jesus is the first face I'm going to see. <laughs>